Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Reapy. As a UC Santa Cruz Alumni Council member, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series, Slugs and Steins Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. For those who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussions with you, the local community of Silicon Valley and our extended community online with a goal of making us all Renaissance women and men. We want it to feel like you're just at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with drinks. So David, another volunteer organizer is with me tonight. Hi, David. We're both alumni and we spend our days in entrepreneurial companies, Silicon Valley style. Uh, David will be helping me with Q&A later and you'll hear more from him at the end. Tonight, we're excited to raise a virtual stein with John Jordan, a research professor of literature at UCSC and director of the Dickens Project. The Dickens Project is an international multi-campus research consortium headquartered at Santa Cruz. Professor Jordan has edited or co-edited several books on and is the author of Supposing, uh, Supposing Bleak House, published in 2010. In addition to a focus on Dickens, Professor Jordan specializes in Victorian literature and culture, the English novel, literature of South Africa, and nar narrative theory. If you have questions for Professor Jordan, type them in the Zoom Q&A box at the bottom, not in the chat box. You don't need to wait to submit your questions. You can type them at any time. If you see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it and we'll ask it sooner. This talk is being recorded you'll be, and you'll be able to find it on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures channel on YouTube in a couple of days. We'll also post uh, that link in our social media channels and our follow-up emails. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, okay, uh, does everyone have their Stein? Great, I've got your slug. Professor Jordan, take it away. <laughs> I have my Stein as, as well. So uh, it's a Toby mug with a, an image from Dickens on the, on the face of it. So I lift a Stein to you and to all of my audience. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you, David, for inviting me to talk with uh, you about Charles Dickens tonight. Uh, my, my topic is reading Dickens today. And uh, today, why should we talk about Dickens? Why should we think about Dickens today? Well, um, Dickens died in 1870. So this year marks 150 years since his death. And anniversaries, round number anniversaries, tend to be times when we uh, celebrate and commemorate important people from, from the past. So that's one reason. Um, also, it's uh, only 10 days or so before Christmas. And for reasons that should be obvious to everyone, uh, Dickens is a name that comes up often uh, in and around that time of year. But I think there's a, there's a third reason, and it has to do with the special nature of uh, this year, 2020, which has been, uh, it's been a, a horrible year for, for all of us, for most of us, uh, the worst years of our lives. And um, I think it's, it's probably the case that many of you, perhaps all of you have thought about the opening sentences of uh, A Tale of Two Cities in relation to this. So I'll, I'll read just a, a few parts of the beginning of A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going to heaven, we were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was very much like the current period. So Dickens is timely, and I'm, I'm going to talk about Dickens, uh, my, my reading Dickens today. I'm going to, uh, my talk has, has three parts. Um, in part one, I will talk about what I think of as the, the afterlife of Charles Dickens. Um, 
uh, Dickens, I think, is, is very much with us today. Uh, and um, I'll speculate about some of the reasons why Dickens has had such a long and enduring uh, afterlife. In, in part two of my talk, I want to read a passage from Dickens that I hope will give you a, a sense of why Dickens is fun to read and fun to think about. And then at the end, in part three, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Dickens project. And Mike has already said a few words about that, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more. So, uh, so part one, um, the Dickens afterlife. Uh, and there's another famous first sentence in Dickens that I'll use to uh, start that part of, of my talk. And it's the first sentence of A Christmas Carol. And many of you probably know that, that first sentence. Uh, it's not as long as the sentence that I read from A Tale of Two Cities. And that sentence is, Marley was dead to begin with. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful sentence. It's a great sentence to start uh, a ghost story with. Um, and the key to that sentence, what makes it such a wonderful sentence is the comma in the middle of it. Marley was dead to begin with. <laughs> and to begin with also uh, says, this is the beginning of a story, but it also says, Marley ain't dead. <laughs> he was dead to begin with. So I think the same we could say is true of Dickens, that Dickens died in 1870, but Dickens is very much alive today. And the evidence for that is, is everywhere around us. Um, Dickens, I think, has become more than just a dead white male author. Uh, he's, he's become part of popular culture throughout the English-speaking world. And uh, our, our image of an author, I think, is in many ways connected with the image of Dickens. That is, a, a middle-aged man with a beard, um, sitting at a desk, wearing a frock coat, holding a quill pen in his hand. And that image of, of Dickens in the act of writing, I think, is, has, has, has become an image of authorship. Um, and then there's another image, another image that I think we associate with Dickens that has become part of popular culture. And it's an image of a, of a hungry child on a city street. Um, and those, those three elements, a child, hunger, and a city street, I think also are likely to evoke the, the word or the term Dickensian. So, so they're images, visual images, I think, that we associate with Dickens. But Dickens is also, uh, 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 Dickens's novels have been translated into film many times. There were over 70 film versions of Dickens novels in the 20th century alone, and they continue to be made now. Um, you can see them on television. Uh, just the other night, last week, there was a Dickens Film Festival on the TCM Turner Classic Movies uh, 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 website uh, uh, program, and uh, it showed four of the most famous classic Dickens novels, Great Expectations, uh, A Tale of Two Cities with Ronald Coleman, uh, A Christmas Carol, and David Copperfield, David Copperfield from 1933 that uh, has W.C. Fields in it as Mr. Micawber. It's a, just a tremendous movie. If you don't know it, you should look it up and, and, and watch it. Um, but Dickens is more than just the films. Dickens is, uh, is theater. Uh, Dickens is, is Oliver. Uh, you know, the musical based on Oliver Twist. And Dickens is The Mystery of Edwin Drood, uh, the last novel that Dickens wrote and did not live to finish. And so when it's uh, performed on stage, uh, the audience gets to vote about who committed the murder and uh, uh, what the ending will be. So Dickens is alive 
in film, Dickens is alive in theater, Dickens is alive uh, in those many, many versions of A Christmas Carol uh, that have been performed on, uh, uh, on community theater stages every holiday season that have been performed by uh, school uh, uh, theater groups. Um, and there's one school theater group that uh, I learned about only recently that I wanted to mention, um, which is uh, 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 by a teacher, uh, a seventh grade teacher, Teague Tubach, who is a UC Santa Cruz graduate alum from Cowell College in 2009. And Teague teaches the seventh grade at, uh, in Morgan Hill, California, just outside of San Jose. And he has a wonderful program every year. He, he gets his seventh grade students to do a theatrical presentation of uh, A Christmas Carol. And the, the students uh, make the, the set and they charge admission. And admission is uh, food that gets donated to the uh, uh, local homeless shelters and food banks. Um, so I, I was delighted to learn about Teague uh, Tubach's uh, class. But Dickens, Dickens is in many other places. I mean, uh, uh, for example, the, the magician, David Copperfield, uh, changed his name when he was 18 years old from uh, David Kotkin to David Copperfield. I assume that he knew that um, Dickens was an amateur magician. Uh, the contemporary David Copperfield magician likes to call himself an illusionist. And I like that term illusionist. I think it's one that could apply to Dickens. And then many of you probably know the um, heavy metal rock band called Uriah Heep. Uh, so, so Dickens has permeated into popular culture in a way that I think very few other authors have done. Um, and throughout the English speaking world in, in the United States, in England, and outside of, of those two principal places, uh, Dickens is also an important figure. His image appears on postage stamps. His image appears on the 10 pound note uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, Dickens is, is everywhere. Uh, I, I, I think uh, you probably have enough familiarity with the uh, extent of his afterlife to, to know uh, that that is the case. So um, I wanted to, to speculate just a little bit about some of the reasons for uh, this remarkable and enduring afterlife. And I'll just run through some of these things. They're, they're features or qualities of Dickens's writing that I think uh, have contributed to the, uh, the, the, the long afterlife and the celebrity of Charles Dickens. And first of all, he's a wonderful storyteller. I mean, people who tell stories are always important people in any culture because stories, narratives are the way that we understand the world around us and understand ourselves. So, so Dickens is a wonderful storyteller. He creates magnificent characters, unforgettable characters. Um, his characters are larger than life. Um, they are theatrical themselves, they're performative, and they're always uh, in the act of performing themselves. I think that's one of the reasons why Dickens lends himself so well to theatrical adaptation. Dickens is a great comic writer, and uh, he's just fun to read because of the, the, the laughter that his stories produce. Um, but there's an, an element of his comedy that I think is always a little bit subversive. Dickens's comedy is not just gratuitous for laughs. It always has an edge to it, even a political edge, because his satire, his comedy is always directed at deflating self-important uh, people. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Um, there's a vividness, a visual vividness to Dickens's writing. That's one of the things that 
uh, is often commented on that uh, he, uh, in, in fact, there are people who have argued that Dickens was a precursor to cinema, a precursor to film. There's a, there's a book called Dickens and the Dream of Cinema. And um, Dickens's novels, or most of them anyway, were illustrated. And I think that the, the fact that the illustrations, which were contemporary with the, the novels themselves, and that Dickens had a lot to, to do with, uh, add to the visual impact of his, uh, of his novels. Um, Dickens is a great writer of childhood. Uh, child characters uh, appear often in his novels. They're often in danger, danger, endangered children. Um, Oliver Twist, Smike in Nicholas Nickleby, uh, Little Nell in The Old Curiosity Shop, Little Paul Dombey. One of the things that Dickens is particularly good at is presenting the child's perspective, the child's point of view. And so I think when we, we think of Dickens, we often think of, of childhood, that image of the, uh, of the child, the hungry child on the street. Um, and then one of the most important ways in which Dickens, I think, has endured for us is the, the way in which he addresses important social problems, um, hunger, homelessness, um, uh, 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 social and economic injustice, class conflict. We need to remember that Dickens was a contemporary of Karl Marx and issues of social class are central in, in many of his, his novels. Um, but one of the things that is important to remember about Dickens's way of addressing uh, social issues is that he thinks not in terms of issues that are caused by bad people, but issues, social problems that are caused by institutions. Dickens is a novelist who addresses institutions as the source of, of, uh, of the social problems that confront his world. And the institutions that he writes about include the law, they include uh, government bureaucracy, they include uh, prisons, they include schools, they include um, the family. Um, and so when you think about Dickens as a social critic, it's, it's uh, I think one of the ways in which he is modern and contemporary is that he thinks about systemic injustice. We've heard a lot about systemic racism recently. And Dickens is an analyst of systems. Um, so uh, the last thing I think that has made Dickens enduring, and it's probably th the most important of all, is Dickens's language. Dickens is a wonderful writer. Um, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to read Dickens aloud. And I think, in fact, that's uh, an important way in which Dickens has continued to uh, to be present in contemporary culture is that he lends himself so well to the spoken word, uh, theater, um, uh, film. And Dickens was himself an oral performer. He, he read uh, passages from his novels. He did public readings. And so the spoken word is an important dimension. And for Dickens, language was an element through which he, he was able to represent the world as he understood it. And whenever you read Dickens and uh, talk about Dickens, I think you need to pay attention, close attention to his language. So one of the things that I wanna do is, um, and, and this is uh, the second part of my talk, is to share with you a passage. Uh, it's actually a couple of passages from Dickens that I am very fond of. And they come from uh, Great Expectations, uh, which was the novel that Dickens published in 1861. And there are two passages that I wanna, wanna look at with you. Um, both of them come from chapter four of Great Expectations. And they describe different moments during the Christmas dinner that takes place in that chapter. Uh, 
the early parts of this novel are told from the perspective of the young boy, working class boy named Pip, who lives, he's an orphan who lives with his sister and her husband, who is Joe Gargery, the blacksmith. And the first passage that I wanna read, it's a short one, is Pip's description of the arrival of the guests that uh, Joe and Pip's sister, Mrs. Joe, mostly Mrs. Joe, since she's the one who's in charge of such things, have invited for the holiday meal. And uh, this scene follows the wonderful opening sequence of the novel in which the young Pip encounters an escaped convict out on the marshes and steals food from the pantry to take to the convict early on Christmas morning. Among the items that he has taken are some bread, a pork pie, a flask of brandy, and in an effort to conceal his theft, he's topped off the original bottle. Um, prominent among the guests on Christmas day is a man named Pumblechook. Uh, Pumblechook is someone whom Pip particularly dislikes and for good reason. He is Pip and Mrs. Joe's uncle. And he's a special favorite of, of Pip's sister, partly because he's from a slightly higher social class. During the dinner that follows, which is a wonderful scene I don't have time to read to you, uh, Pip describes sitting miserably through the holiday meal as he is made the subject or rather the object of a lecture by Mr. Pumblechook in which Pip is regularly compared to the pork dinner that the guests have been eating and whose least appetizing parts, that is parts of the pig, have ended up on Pip's plate. The longer Pumblechook speaks, the more that he and Mrs. Joe go on about ungrateful boys who had to be brought up by hand, the more we sense Pip, Pip's resentment. And finally, as the dinner comes to an end, Mrs. Joe offers Pumblechook a glass of brandy to finish off the meal. So the second passage I'll read is an account of what happens when Pumblechook drinks the brandy. So here's the first passage, it's on, on your, your screen. I opened the door to the company, making believe that it was a habit of ours to open that door. And I opened it first to Mr. Wopsle, next to Mr. and Mrs. Hubble, and last of all to Uncle Pumblechook. N B. I was not allowed to call him uncle under the severest penalties. Mrs. Joe said Uncle Pumblechook, a large, hard breathing, middle aged, slow man with a mouth like a fish, dull staring eyes and sandy hair standing upright on his head so that he looked as if he had just been all but choked and had that moment come too. I have brought you as the compliments of the season. I have brought you mum, a bottle of sherry wine, and I have brought you mum, a bottle of port wine. So show the second slide. And the second slide is an illustration of the arrival of Mr. Pumblechook uh, at the Christmas dinner at uh, Mrs. Joe's house. So go back to the first slide again, please. Thank you. So. The first detail to notice about uh, this passage is the way that Pumblechook is introduced. He's one of those minor characters in Dickens with a funny name who are comic from the moment they arrive on scene. He's a large, hard breathing, middle-aged, slow man, etc. cetera. Uh, he's a grotesque caricature, almost a cartoon figure of the sort that Dickens is famous for creating. But there's another, another level to the comedy here that I want to point out to you. If we stop and ask who has been choking Pumblechook, the answer is that it must be Pip, who in his role as narrator, with the help of Dickens, of course, has the ability to reach out through the language he uses, put his hands figuratively around Pumblechook's throat, choke him until he could hardly breathe, and then release him to attend the Christmas dinner. The older Pip who tells the story still detests Pumblechook and starts to abuse him from the moment 
he arrives. A second joke in this passage that I want to call to your attention is the little passage that um, begins uh, NB, I was not allowed to call him uncle under the severest penalties. Um, this is a joke that runs through this passage and indeed through the whole book. Every time that Pip uses the phrase Uncle Pumblechook, he's breaking a rule imposed on him when he was a boy and taking pleasure now in the time of writing and with the freedom he has as an adult to uh, uh, violate that, that prohibition. It's a way of getting back at his sister who wants to keep Uncle Pumblechook to herself. And it's also a dig at Pumblechook himself. So let's go on to the second scene. So uh, go to slide three, yes. So this is the scene that describes what happens when uh, Mrs. Joe offers a bottle of brand, a, a, a drink of brandy to Pumblechook. So it's, um, have a little brandy, uncle, said my sister. Oh, heavens, it had come at last. He would find it was weak. He would say it was weak and I was lost. I held tight to the leg of the table under the cloth with both hands and awaited my fate. My sister went for the stone bottle, came back with the stone bottle and poured his brandy out, no one else taking any. The wretched man trifled with his glass, took it up, looked at it through the light, put it down, prolonged my misery. All this time, Mrs. Joe and Joe were briskly clearing the table for the pie and pudding. So next slide. I couldn't keep my eyes off him, always holding tight by the leg of the table with my hands and feet. I saw the miserable creature finger his glass playfully, take it up, smile, throw his head back and drink the brandy off. Instantly afterwards, the company were seized with unspeakable consternation, owing to his springing to his feet, turning round several times in an appalling spasmodic whooping cough dance and rushing out at the door. He then became visible through the window, violently plunging and expectorating, making the most hideous faces and apparently out of his mind. The next slide. I held on tight while Mrs. Joe and Joe ran to him. I didn't know how I had done it, but I had no doubt I had murdered him somehow. In my dreadful situation, it was a relief when he was brought back and surveying the company all round as if they had disagreed with him, sank down into his chair with a one significant gasp, tar. I had filled up the bottle from the tar water jug. I knew he would be worse by and by. I moved the table like a medium of the present day by the vigor of my unseen hold about it, uh, upon it. It's a, it's a great comic passage. And we get to see uh, Pumblechook getting the well-deserved punishment. It turns out that Pip has inadvertently filled up the brandy bottle when he stole food and drink to take to the convict out on the, on the moor. Um, now, he may have done this unconsciously or inadvertently, but I have a feeling that he did it knowingly. He did it knowingly in part because Pip knows that brandy is an adult drink. It's for grownups only. And it's reserved for guests on a special occasion like Christmas. Tar water, on the other hand, was a common 19th century home remedy, a diuretic administered to children in order to ensure regular bowel movements. It's what Mrs. Joe uses to control Pip's digestive tract when she thinks he has been bolting his food. By putting tar water in the brandy bottle, Pip ensures that only an adult will drink it. He may even know or at least suspect that Mrs. Joe will offer it to Uncle Pumblechook at the end of the meal. When Pumblechook drinks from the bottle and we see him almost explode before our very eyes, Pip is initially filled with dread that he may have murdered him somehow, but secretly, he is pleased, and so are we, to see Pumblechook get what he deserves. Moreover, Pip knows from firsthand experience what the effect on Pumblechook will be 
which is why he slyly observes at the end of the passage, I knew he would be worse by and by. Like the passage describing the arrival of the guests, this passage also operates simultaneously on different narrative levels. The young Pip who's seated at the dinner table clings desperately to the table leg out of fear that his theft of food and drink will soon be discovered. He holds on to the leg of the table in order to keep from dashing out the door in an effort to escape. But he also source of strength in that table leg. The table leg recalls the convict's leg from the day before, as well as the stolen bread that Pip had stuffed down the leg of his trousers to bring to the convict. The table leg thus reinforces Pip's identification with the convict. He feels like a prisoner at the dinner table and like a criminal for having stolen the food. But at the same time, he begins to take on some of the convict's strength. And we might think of, uh, of that table leg as a kind of figure for uh, the convict's masculine or even phallic power. Pip's grasp on the table leg is so strong that he's able as if by some supernatural or superhuman power to lift the dinner table off the floor. I moved the table, he says, like a medium of the present day by the vigor of my unseen hold upon it. The phrase a medium of the present day is a reference to the 19th century practice of spiritualism. Spirit medium, so-called, claim to be able to communicate with the spirits of deceased loved ones who made their presence known by rapping on tables or even causing them to elevate during a seance. But these mediums were regularly uh, exposed as charlatans who were themselves producing the effects that they attributed to the spirits. The medium of the present day, that phrase that Pip uses, whose unseen hold moves the table, and who administers the dose of tar water to Uncle Pumblechook is of course Pip in his role as narrator and also Dickens in his role as novelist. The instrument of power, the table leg, is both the writer's pen and a kind of magic control stick in what I like to think of as a 19th century version of a video game that allows the player to manipulate figures in imaginary or virtual space. We even have a 19th century version of the television or computer screen, the window that frames the scene of Pumblechook coughing and expectorating. The whole episode operates like a cartoon sequence, uh, slowing down as Pumblechook toys with his glass, holds it up for examination before suddenly speeding up as he drinks the brandy, dashes out of the house and reappears outside the window. This is one of the things I think that people mean when they say that Dickens was, has a cinematic imagination. This whole thing could be imagined as a, as a little film script. So uh, if we step back from this scene a little bit and think about it as a whole, I think we can see in it several things that I talked about that are part of what makes Dickens uh, still be alive for us today. First of all, it's a Christmas story. It's easy to forget, but this is a, a Christmas story. And if we think of it as a Christmas story, we can see that the events that happen inside the house are the bad version of Christmas, this horrible dinner that Tip has been made to sit through. And the good Christmas is the one that was celebrated outside on the, on the, uh, on the marshes where Pip takes food and shares it with the escaped convict, with the homeless person. And I think we can also see in this passage the subversive comedy that is always part of the political edge of, of Dickens's writing. That this is a scene where the pompous and authority figure, Pumblechook and also Mrs. Joe, um, are objects of Dickens's satire and the figure of lower status, the, the lower class figure who is in this scene is the child, um, actually gets to wreak revenge on the authority figures. 
And the passage as a whole is, it's, it's a piece of slapstick comedy. Um, it even has a kind of crude, almost, you know, toilet humor to it with the, the tar water joke. Uh, but it's at the same time, a fairly sophisticated play on words, because I think the whole scene can be understood as the uh, narrative equivalent of the idiomatic phrase to turn the tables on someone. That this is a scene in which Pip as the child holding on to the leg of the table has turned the tables on the adults who persecuted him. So um, I, I love this passage. I like to teach it. I like to talk about it. And I just recently discovered and show the next slide, an illustration that accompanies it that goes to a, um, it's an illustration from a pirated uh, American edition that was published in 1861. And you can see the guests, uh, Uncle Pumblechook has just uh, uh, swallowed the glass of brandy. Uh, the brandy glass is lying turned over on the top of the table. And at the bottom right, you can see Pip uh, with his hands and legs holding on to the leg of the table. And I, I like this also because I think it does suggest in the way that his hands are located that he's holding on to uh, something phallic, something male that uh, uh, he uh, that links him to the to the convict uh, outside on the marsh. So I want to uh, end my talk by telling you a little bit about the Dickens project. So let's go to the the last slide. Um, uh, this is uh, a description of the Dickens project. The Dickens project is an international scholarly consortium headquartered at UC Santa Cruz. Its membership consists of over 40 American and international universities and colleges, including campuses of the University of California. The mission of the Dickens Project, as the second paragraph says, is threefold. To promote and carry out research and teaching on Charles Dickens and 19th century literature and culture, to share its research findings with students, teachers, scholars, and members of the general public through conferences and public humanities projects. And lastly, to professionalize the next generation of 19th century studies scholars. Um, you know, the Dickens Project, the main event that we sponsor is a summer conference called the Dickens Universe. And it's a unique event. It's, it's an event that brings together scholars from around the world, graduate students from the member institutions of, uh, of the Dickens Project. There are over 40 member institutions. It brings together teachers, high school teachers, community college teachers. It brings uh, students, undergraduates. It brings high school students. Uh, and it brings uh, members of the general public through the um, what used to be called the Elder Hostel Program, now called Road Scholars. And it lasts for a week. And it has elements of, uh, of a book club, uh, of a scholarly conference, of uh, uh, a festival, and summer camp. And it takes place at Santa Cruz in the summer, so it is a kind of summer camp. It's a week-long conference. Most scholarly conferences are three days long, but this one is one that lasts for a week. And it has elements of, uh, of a festival. It has Victorian teas, it has a Victorian dance on the last night. There are various films and performances, other entertainments. Uh, we have Victorian tea every, every day. And it's a, it's a total environment. And the thing that is special about the Dickens universe is that everyone is reading the same book. It features every year a single novel by Dickens. So this is the 40th year of the existence of the Dickens Project. We started in uh, 1980 um, and uh, Dickens wrote 14 novels. We've gone through 
most of them at least twice, and some of them we've done three times. And this past summer, because of the pandemic, we were unable to have the in-person conference, so we had a virtual conference. And we've decided that next summer, even though we have the vaccine and things will have improved, that we think we need to have another virtual conference. So in 2021, the featured text for the Dickens universe will be A Christmas Carol. Uh, it will be Christmas in July. And we will show many of the film versions of A Christmas Carol. Uh, we will talk about the parodies of A Christmas Carol. Um, and we will do a deep read about A Christmas Carol. Um, the Dickens Project has as one of its activities, and I'm, I'm gonna explain the image that accompanies this uh, description of the Dickens Project. One of the activities of the Dickens Project is something called Deciphering Dickens. And it's a project that the scholars of the Dickens Project have engaged in with British scholars of Dickens and also with the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And the Victoria and Albert, the V&A as it is called, is the repository of all of the manuscripts or most of the manuscripts of Dickens's novels. There, there are a few that are located in other, in other places. And one of the things that the V&A has decided that it wants to do is to transcribe all of the manuscripts of, of Dickens so that we have not just the final text, but that we have the strike throughs, the changes and everything that uh, Dick, all the, a record of all the changes that Dickens made. And I've worked a little bit with Dickens's handwriting and I assure you that it's very difficult to, uh, to decipher. But the v &A has made uh, virtual uh, images of Dickens's manuscripts and has sent them to us at the Dickens Project. And during the summer, we do a crowdsourced version of deciphering Dickens. So what you see is a student, an, an undergraduate, a couple of undergraduates looking on a computer at a virtual image of the manuscript of Little Dorrit, one of, one of Dickens's late novels where the handwriting is particularly challenging and they are transcribing the, uh, the words that they see, transcribing the strike throughs, the interlineations and what will eventually be produced is a, an online scholarly version of the Dickens manuscripts with accompanying transcription. So this is just one example of the kind of scholarly activity that the Dickens Project engages in. Uh, it's, uh, as I say, it's a scholarly consortium. It's the most important annual uh, conference on Dickens, scholarly conference on Dickens in the world. And it's open to the general public. I think this is again, one of the special features of Dickens that Dickens appeals not just to scholars, but he appeals to uh, young readers. He appeals to old readers. He appeals to the general public. And so uh, I hope that some of you will look on the Dickens Project website. And uh, when we announce the dates, they'll be the end of July, the last full week in July. Uh, that you too will uh, attend and participate in the virtual Dickens universe that will take place in, in 2021. I also call attention to the website uh, uh, the, uh, you can find at dickens.ucsc.edu. And there you will also find a, um, a place where you can, uh, you can donate to the Dickens Project. We get no funding from the University of California. We get space for our offices um, and we are entirely dependent on the memberships uh, of the different universities who belong to the Dickens Project 
on the conference registrations that um, people pay when they come to the Dickens universe and private gifts. So I hope that some of you will be moved after learning about the activity of the Dickens Project to donate to us. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the Pumblechook passage. And uh, we'll now uh, take some questions and uh, I'll try and answer them. So you may ask about any aspect of Dickens, not just what I talked about in my presentation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Professor. Again, uh, please enter your questions down in the Q&A box at the bottom and you can also vote up and down. Stephen has the first question. Can you enlighten us as to how Dickens came up with such names as Pumblechook? <laughs> um, Dickens is, is famous for, uh, for the names of, of his characters. And there's, uh, there's precedent for this that goes back to the 18th century English novel where characters were often named according to types. So Dickens is continuing this, um, uh, but in a more inventive way. Sometimes the names do indicate uh, some aspect of the character who carries the unusual name. Pumblechook, I think, uh, is a bumbling figure and he's a figure who gets choked both by the brandy and by the introduction that the that Pip as narrator gives to him. So sometimes you can find connections between the name and some aspect of the character. Oliver Twist is a famous example of this. Uh, why is he called Oliver? Uh, Dickens is thinking about Oliver Cromwell, uh, who was a famous leader of a revolution against uh, the authority of the time, who was the king. Um, and Twist, is uh, a name uh, that uh, he's actually given by the beetle, Mr. Bumble, um, because it's predicted that one day he will be hanged. And twist is a slang term for hanging. So um, he's both a rebel, an Oliver Cromwell figure, and a character who's destined to be hanged. So Dickens's creativity is on full display with all of his names. Oh, next question is from Silva. What is your favorite novel by Dickens and why is it your favorite? Oh, golly, that's, that's a hard question for me to answer. I, I, I have to start by saying Bleak House is my favorite novel because I, I wrote a book about Bleak House. I was so um, it, totally immersed in, in that novel. But I'm currently working on, on David Copperfield and so David Copperfield is starting to edge out Bleak House as my current favorite. And one of the reasons that I like both of those novels is that both of them have a first person narrator. And the example that I gave you from uh, Great Expectations interests me also because it's told by, uh, by Pip. Uh, Pip is the, is the narrator. So I'm particularly interested in the ways in which narrators use the act of telling a story in order to achieve certain effects. And Bleak House is an experimental novel. It's, it's, uh, um, uh, it's, it's unusual in that it has two narrators. Uh, one is an omniscient third person narrator and the other is a first person female narrator. So it's quite unusual for Dickens to impersonate a, a woman. Uh, Esther Summerson is the, the name of that character. But I'm interested in Bleak House also because I think um, it's a profoundly psychological novel. And in addition to the narrative uh, interest that it contains, uh, I think it's also a novel about psychological trauma. Dickens is sometimes uh, uh, described or negatively described as a character, uh, as, a, as a novelist who deals in flat characters as opposed to round characters, as if 
roundness were always superior to flatness. But I think that Dickens has great flat characters, Pumblechook being an example of a flat character. But flat characters can often have great complexity to them. And Bleak House is a novel in which um, there are flat characters and characters who also have considerable psychological depth. Um, Esther Summerson, the narrator, is a young woman who was abandoned at birth. And I think she's a good example of, uh, of a case study in psychological trauma. So she can be analyzed using techniques of uh, psychoanalysis. So I think it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a mistake to think of Dickens only as a, a novelist of superficialities of flat comic characters. In David Copperfield, um, which is also a first person narrative, uh, not enough attention has been paid to the motives of David in telling his story. And for me, David is an unreliable narrator. He's a narrator who's telling the story of his life, but there are parts of his life that he doesn't want to look at. So I think you can see through and see beyond the story that David tells to other stories that are hidden under the um, the story of growing up that he likes to tell. So, so Dickens is a, is a very sophisticated and complex uh, uh, novelist in, in ways that I think have not always been recognized. So those are my two candidates for uh, favorite novels right now. Speaking of uh, not being recognized, uh, Brigham starts by stating that you talked about how Dickens has lived on in our time through pop culture. It seems the other side of the coin is that many of works were not actually appreciated in his time. Do you think this is because Dickens was writing for a future audience? Or do you think that there is something inherent about his writing that makes it more relevant today than it was then? Well, Dickens was writing very much for his contemporary audience. Um, he, he was a writer who earned his living by writing. And uh, if the sales of his novels started to dip, he was able, because all of his novels or almost all of them were published in serial installments, he was able to come up with a new uh, Plit, uh, plot twist in order to create interest. The greatest example of this, the one that is most often cited, is Martin Chuzzlewit, which was not one of the most popular novels in its time. And as the stale sales started to, to go down, Dickens turns around and sends his characters off to America, and then the sales picked up again. Um, but Dickens was popular in his own time. I mean, some novels were more popular than others. Certainly, the Pickwick Papers, the early novels, were, uh, were famously popular. Um, uh, the Old Curiosity Shop, where people were uh, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, were uh, wondering whether uh, Little Nell was going to live or whether she would die. Uh, oh, please don't let her die, Mr. Dickens. Um, but uh, I don't think Dickens thought about the audience of the future. I think Dickens was focused very much on his contemporary moment, um, but he did uh, um, achieve fame and, uh, and fortune as well in his own time and was uh, admired by uh, uh, people from the lowest orders of society to the very top, including Queen Victoria. Well, we have a, we have a question from uh, Moira. Um, this is about uh, 2022. Will David Copperfield and Lola Leroy be the texts for the project? Uh, yes, uh, originally, this, this is another aspect of um, of the study of Dickens that uh, we're doing in the Dickens Project. Uh, sometimes we 
focus on two novels, one by Dickens and one by another 19th century writer. And our original plan for 2021 had been to focus on the, um, uh, actually for 2020 had been to focus on uh, David Copperfield and the, uh, the novel Iola Leroy, which is by the uh, 19th century African-American novelist, Francis E.W. Harper. And we had to postpone the 2020 Dickens universe. Um, and originally we thought that we would be able to do the David Copperfield, Iola Leroy uh, double pairing um, in 2021. But we've decided just to be safe that we will and make sure that we can do that pairing uh, in person at UC Santa Cruz that we'll postpone that uh, two novel focus until 2022. So 2021 will be a Christmas Carol as a virtual conference. And by 2022, we're hopeful that we'll be able to uh, convene again in person at, uh, at, at, at Santa Cruz. And the focus there will be David Copperfield and Iola Leroy. So we're returning shortly to a question from Stephanie, but first a, uh, a note from Tim. He states, please read John's very thorough and insightful book, Supposing Bleak House. If this was not your favorite novel prior to John's revelations, it certainly will become so. <laughs> and now to Stephanie. The illustration of Uncle Pumblechuck is fascinating. I'm not certain, but there seems to be a darker shading to his face. Is the illustrator, whom I think you mentioned was American, invoking racial difference here in your estimation? If so, yep. does this have any connection to what Dickens might have been up to? Well, I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question. And we should go back, um, Kristen, if you can, to slide number six, I think it is, in the slideshow, um, and look at that very, very interesting illustration. Um, so uh, can you bring up the image, Kristen? And in, in beginning to answer that question, I have to say that I discovered this illustration only last week as I was beginning to prepare this talk. So I had never seen it before last week. The, uh, I mentioned that it's an American edition. It's a pirated edition. It was published in 1861. I uh, have the name of the publisher and I also have, I don't, don't remember it right now, the name of the illustrator. But the thing that struck me immediately about that image is that some or most or perhaps all of the figures in it appear to have dark skins. Um, now, none of the, yes, here's the, here's the image. Uh, the two characters, on the left, the man and the woman with their backs to us seem to me to have dark skin. Um, the boy and Mrs. Joe in the background have faces that are partly darkened. Um, that could be shadow. It could be, um, could be a racial marker. And then the image of Uncle Pumplechook is extraordinary. Uh, it too could be understood as racialized. Um, the mouth and the lips seem to me to suggest that, or they could be the reaction, the um, you know, a, a darkening of the face as uh, he um, has uh, consumed the bottle of brandy. Uh, the figure going out the door at the back seems also to be dark. The only character who is 
uh, seems to have a white face or a light-skinned face is the, the one underneath the, the portrait. So I don't know what to make of this and it uh, puzzles me and intrigues me. Uh, I have, uh, the, it's very difficult to get a copy of this uh, pirated edition. I found a copy on eBay that is for sale for $800. Uh, I'm not about to purchase it. I'm going to ask the library at Santa Cruz to see if they can find a copy through interlibrary loan. I did The eBay copy does have one other illustration in which some of the same characters, not Uncle Pumblechook, uh, but certainly Pip and, um, and Joe Gargery, the figure who's going out the door, uh, appear. And they do not have dark skin. So if there is any kind of racial mark illustrations to the novel, uh, I, so far as I know, they appear only in this image. Um, what could be happening? The characters in the novel are certainly not uh, dark skinned. Uh, they are British, white British subjects. Uh, although Pip at one point no, I'm thinking of a different novel. Pip, Pip is never, uh, um, there's no racial marking uh, that accompanies Pip in the text of the novel, but he is um, someone who works at surgery, is a blacksmith. And so, uh, and Dickens, if you know anything about Dickens's biography, Dickens worked at a blacking factory. Um, and it's hard to work at a blacking factory, a factory that makes shoe polish without getting yourself uh, blackened a little bit. So there's a, there is a theme, there's a biographical theme and, uh, and even a, a fictional theme that runs through Dickens's novels with jokes about shoe polish, about shoe blacking. And it's conceivable that something like that might in some distant way be reflected in this image. But I'm glad you asked the question. I'm glad you noticed it. And um, I will try and find out more in an attempt to answer this puzzle. So next question from Binet. Could you comment on the place of the cricket on the hearth? Just a sentimental fairy tale? Uh, I enjoyed it very much, sentimental or not. Uh, pretty much ditto the, the chimes. Maybe a larger question is how uh, Dickens used his audience's notions and expectations of sentimentality for Dickens's own purposes. Um, the, the big question there is, is of course, sentimentality. And um, Dickens, uh, that's again, one of the um, things that sometimes is held against Dickens, that his, his novels are too sentimental, there, there are too many tears that are shed, uh, there are all, almost always a deathbed scene um, that's a tearjerker scene. Um, but uh, this has to be understood in the context of one of the popular traditions that Dickens is writing within, which is melodrama. Melodrama uh, on the stage, or as it was translated, uh, into uh, narrative fiction uh, always includes extreme uh, situations of emotion, extreme emotional situations. Um, and uh, Dickens uh, loved to go to the theater. He loved uh, melodrama and he draws on the tradition of melodrama in almost all of his novels. And um, so Cricket on the Hearth and The Chimes are both Christmas books. And uh, Christmas was for Dickens a favorite time of the year. And it was also a time of, um, of inwardness, um, a time for meditation and contemplation. Most of the Christmas books uh, that he wrote are uh, have ghost stories or have some element of ghostliness about them. And I think that's also a way in which you can think of Dickens as, um, as writing out of a tradition of sentimentality. 
but those those books are also, I think, dialectical. That is, they're they're about turning inward, about Christmas time as a time for self-reflection, but also and and ghosts are are uh, uh, one sort of symbolic way of of indicating that inward turn that uh, that uh, Scrooge certainly is compelled to take. But they're, the novels are dialectical in the sense that they, they also turn outward to the world again. So um, uh, you'll always find sentiment in Dickens and there's usually some slapstick comedy alongside it that gives you another uh, extreme emotion to accompany the sentiment. Or Mike, in your view, which Dickens novel best fits this particular best of times, worst of times? Well, there are two novels that uh, that deal with issues of public health. I, I, I spoke about the some of the social issues, social problems that Dickens addresses. And um, the 19th century had its own uh, pandemics, or at least epidemics. One of them was cholera, uh, and another was smallpox, and another was typhoid fever. Um, Bleak House is a novel that has a smallpox epidemic in, in the middle of it. Um, and it's a novel that uses uh, disease as a metaphor. There's a famous passage near the middle of Bleak House in which the narrator, the omniscient narrator says, what connection can there be uh, between Joe, the crossing sweeper, the, the little homeless boy who dies at one point later in the novel? What connection can there be between Joe, the crossing sweeper, and uh, the members of society at the highest levels? And the connection that Dickens sees is the connection of disease because disease travels invisibly from the poor to the wealthy. And it goes to prove for Dickens that uh, society is not a set of disparate social classes. Society is, in his view, organic. It is, it is connected, the low and the high. Um, the other novel that has a public health issue in it is Little Dart which opens with, in the, uh, with a ship arriving in the port of Marseille in the south of France. And uh, because of a cholera epidemic, the boat has to go into quarantine. So Dickens uh, was aware of and was a, uh, an outspoken critic of public health. Uh, uh, the, uh, the other image in Bleak House that's connected to this theme is the fog. In the opening chapter of, uh, of Bleak House, there's a famous description of the fog. Fog up the river, fog down the river. It has one of those repetitive uh, sentence structures the way that uh, uh, Tale of Two Cities does. But fog was not just the benign fog that creeps in on little cat's feet uh, in the Sandberg poem, or that comes up from uh, Monterey Bay to the campus of UC Santa Cruz. Fog in London in the 19th century was composed of soot and uh, from the coal fires and the, the factories that surrounded the city of London. And um, there was also the theory of disease before the germ theory of disease was, uh, uh, was accepted um, that uh, uh, disease spread through the air, through what was known as malaria or miasma. And malaria, the term malaria literally means bad air. And that's something that has, uh, is of course, uh, very current now with uh, COVID-19, uh, which we know is an airborne uh, virus. Okay, question from Jonathan. How do you yourself and how do others evaluate Dickens in the context of contemporary activity 
expanding the canon beyond accepted classics. Are there contemporary authors you can identify who are carrying on Dickens' legacy? Um, there, it's, it's a lot of fun to read contemporary fiction with your ear attuned to Dickens. There are some novels that are deliberate um, updates of Dickens' novels that are uh, rewritings of Dickens' plots, um, uh, just as there are lots of rewritings of A Christmas Carol. Uh, one of the best of those is, um, is the novel Jack Maggs by an Australian novelist, um, uh, Peter Carey. And Jack Maggs is a telling of the story of the convict from Great Expectations from the convict's point of view or from, the, uh, from, a, from a different angle from the angle that Dickens takes. One of the contemporary novels that I particularly admire and that's often described as a Dickensian novel. Dickensian in that sense often means any novel that's set in a city, any novel that's over 600 pages long, uh, any novel that includes a child, <laughs> And one uh, very interesting novel that has all of those elements and that also has some uh, specific allusions to Dickens is um, The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt, who's a contemporary American uh, novelist. And it's a novel that is set in New York City and also in Las Vegas. And those two locations, one of the things that Dickens is, um, is famous for, it's another quality or attribute of his writing that uh, I think has, has given him the, um, the afterlife that we, uh, we're aware of, is that he's the great novelist of the modern city, at least in English, Balzac in, in French, Balzac and Victor Hugo. Um, but uh, Donna Tartt's novel, The Goldfinch, is a novel that is in love with New York City. Um, and then the scene changes to a very different landscape. The, uh, the, the opposite if in, in many ways of, of, uh, of, of the old urban environment. So, so that's an example of, of a of a novel that is Dickensian in style and, and setting that's not explicitly a rewriting of, uh, of, of Dickens. So uh, we have two things before we wrap up tonight. One more question and then a poll. So hang on, you'll, have, you'll all have rules in the poll from Teague. Did Dickens ever publicly and directly comment on Marx outside of the mirroring of similar social critiques in his novels? No, Dickens was unaware of Karl Marx. Marx read Dickens. Dickens did not read Marx or comment on him. Um, Dickens, was, uh, Dickens was more of a liberal um, than he was a revolutionary. Uh, a reading of A Tale of Two Cities, a reading of uh, Barnaby Rudge, the earlier novel that deals with the uh, London anti-Catholic riots of the 1780s. Um, uh, but Dickens understood the reasons why revolutions might happen. So there's a great deal of sympathy for the poor, a great deal of understanding of the reasons for revolution a great deal of understanding of revolutionary figures, even, um, even if they turn out in the end to be people who, because of the requirements of the plot, have to be excluded or killed off. But um, so uh, in, in his own terms, uh, and, and this is something that I'm uh, very much interested in, uh, in some of the work that I'm doing on, on David Copperfield is that I think Dickens was sympathetic to the Chartist movement. I think Dickens understood and 
uh, uh, had, had, had a great deal of sympathy for uh, individual Chartists, but not for violent revolution. So uh, the Chartist movement, which was a working class movement to try and uh, extend the franchise to all um, adult males, uh, extending the franchise to women was a long ways off in the 19th century, but adult male franchise was an issue that was uh, very much um, at issue in uh, and a central tenant of the, of the Chartist movement. And I think Dickens was sympathetic to that kind of radicalism, not the radicalism that led to uh, the use of physical force, but that led to reform of social institutions. So no Marx in Dickens, uh, a lot of Dickens in Marx. Well, thank you for that, uh, Professor Jordan. We do, uh, uh, as, as David mentioned, we have a little poll for you. I think as everybody knows, we can't do these in person anymore, um, but we would like to give a little bit of that in-person feel and we can learn a little bit about each other here. So take a minute to answer some of these poll questions and you'll be able to see the results. Well, I should say in the meantime, uh, thank you to all the members of the audience who uh, listen to me talk about Dickens. I hope you uh, will go and read A Christmas Carol. It's a wonderful thing to do during the holiday season. And I, I hope that you will come and attend a virtual and perhaps ultimately an in-person Dickens universe one summer in Santa Cruz. Yeah, thank you. And I think uh, we, can, we can continue the Q&A while people are looking at that poll. Um, maybe a couple more questions, we'll see. Uh, question from Stephen. What benefits do you expect to derive from transcribing uh, those original manuscripts that you mentioned? Well, you, you learn better uh, how Dickens made his novels. Um, you, you can see the changes that he made along the way. Uh, you can see turns of phrase that he considered and then struck out. So it's, it's particularly useful for the kind of close analysis of Dickens's language that uh, so many people want to, to do. And um, uh, it's also uh, the, the best way to get access to the actual creative process. Dickens didn't talk very much about what his creative process was, how he went about writing his novels. Um, we do have one wonderful story about how he wrote his novels, which is that his daughter Mamie once um, was, uh, um, was, was sick and was allowed to stay home from school and to sit in her father's study while he wrote. And she gave a description of how he went about writing and his process was to stand at his writing desk, he wrote standing up, um, mumble to himself, run over to the mirror, look in the mirror, mumble, make faces in the mirror, and then run back to his writing desk and transcribe what he had just acted out. So it's a, it's a strongly visual process. Again, I talked about Dickens as a visual writer. It's a very theatrical, uh, kind of writing process because Dickens is acting out the character as he's uh, imagining the, the character. So um, but what we will have once we have transcribed the, the manuscripts is the actual writing process and the, the false starts and the changes that were made along the way. Thank you for answering the poll. We have a few on the East Coast, so we are going to uh, we're going to have to wrap up for the sake of them getting the proper sleep. But we do have uh, one question that's interesting, given that this is gift giving season. Which of the Dickens books would you recommend gifting to a friend who is not familiar with but wants to learn about nineteenth century writing? Mm. Um, I usually tell people to start with great expectations. 
And the reason is that uh, there are two reasons. One, it's, it's a little shorter than, uh, than Bleak House and David Copperfield. And when I say shorter, I mean 400 pages in a penguin as opposed to 800 in a penguin for uh, David Copperfield and, and, and Bleak House. And it's also a story that um, as my example from earlier this, this evening shows, it's a novel that's told in the first person. So there's, there's a, a single line story that's easier to follow. Uh, when you read Bleak House, there are two narrators, there are uh, a, a very complicated uh, detective story plot, um, uh, dozens of characters, there are new characters get, who get introduced in almost every chapter uh, through the first uh, 450 pages of, of the book. Uh, so keeping track of the characters alone is, is a big challenge. There are fewer characters uh, in Great Expectations. So that's a good place to begin. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. And thank you especially, John, for joining us and sharing your inspiration. Uh, everyone out there, please uh, share your applause virtually down in the Q&A box. You can add them in. Thank you. Uh, this talk has been recorded and will be available again on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel in just a few days. I want a second big round of applause for the staff of the alumni and special events offices who set this online forum up. Thank you, Cara, Diana, Paulina, Kristen, and Nikki. And thank you, Kristen, for the help with the slides. Our next event is Monday, January 11, 11th, and it is titled Lights, Camera, Action, Animal-Born Video Cameras Show a Whale's Perspective, and will feature associate researcher at the UCSC Institute for Marine Sciences, Ari Friedlander. Ari's research focuses on using biologging technology to study the underwater behavior of marine mammals. More specifically, Ari is interested in the foraging ecology of these ocean giants and how environmental change impacts these animals. Ari has led pioneering studies of whales in Antarctica for over 20 years to understand the impacts of commercial whaling and rapid climate change. Locally in California, Ari studies the impacts of Navy sonar and other anthropogenic stressors on the behavior and survival of marine mammals. Ari is currently working with BBC and Netflix on documentary films. In this talk, in January 11th, he will explore the underwater lives of the largest and smallest baleen whales in local and the most report, remote parts of the planet. Blue whales from California, humpback whales from South Africa, and minke whales from the Antarctica. Meanwhile, I'll bet you haven't gotten enough Dickens-themed plays. Well, UCSC has a couple virtual tickets to fill that void. The first is Christmas Carol 2. Scrooge Strikes Back, a fog-soaked comedy carriage ride through Zoom area London where Scrooge, newly refreshed with the Christmas spirit, turns his greed into zealotry. You'll find the links, by the way, on the calendar.ucsc.edu site or arts.ucsc.edu. Now the second recorded last night and soon to be released on the UCSC Arts and Lectures YouTube channel is Christmas with Dickens, a new twist on an old ghost stories. In the second tale, Charles Dickens just wants to talk about his book, A Christmas Carol. But what happens when spirits start to show up? Is Dickens being guilt trapped by his estranged wife, Catherine, haunted by the ghost of Christmas present, 
regretting his portrayal of Ebenezer Scrooge. And what is Queen Victoria doing there? It's chaos, confusion, conflict, and complaints, just like your typical holiday gathering. So on behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Alumni Association, thank you for joining us. Please come back on January 11th for our next virtual event. And by the way, that means pay attention to the virus. Think of Dickens and uh, what, he, what he was warning for. So don't pretend it's not there. It is out to get you. Again, thank you. Be back on the 11th.